Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here today for our third issue briefing here at the World Economic Forum 2015 annual meeting. Welcome also to our viewers who are watching this live on our webcast platform at weforum.org. Just a, a brief explanation. This is an issue briefing, not a press conference. It's an innovation of this year's, uh, this year's meeting. What we're doing is we're taking some of the finest brains from the Congress Center upstairs here in Davos Clusters and, and, and putting them out and, and getting them to share their wisdom and their insights and their experience on, on, on critical and, and pressing matters of the day. The theme of this issue briefing is the economic outlook for Latin America. I'm very delighted to be joined by Elen Goldfein, the chief economist of Itau Unibanco in Brazil. Elen's going to offer some remarks, uh, his view, his outlook on the Latin American economy. Then, of course, we'll open the floor for questions. Elen. Well, we, um, uh, we are now in... Um, yeah, in a period very challenging for Latin America, uh, both from uh, uh, external uh, factors as well as domestic issues. From the external part, uh, we had a very nice uh, commodity cycle. Uh, it seems to be over. Commodities are down. Uh, China is decelerating, which uh, doesn't seem to uh, uh, somehow lead to higher commodities. It's probably going to, at the best, uh, stabilize commodities. Uh, and, the, and the global uh, growth is not great. Uh, we're going to see some improvement in growth this year, in global growth this year from last year, especially because of the US. Uh, but probably not enough uh, to bring Latin America back to very strong growth. Uh, we had uh, a couple of years of deceleration. In some countries, even more. Uh, in the case of Brazil, we had four years of uh, growth deceleration. In some countries, uh, are doing better. For example, Colombia, the growth last year was 4.7. Uh, but the rest of the region seems to be decelerating uh, quite a bit. Uh, domestic policies are somehow also uh, to blame in some countries. Uh, we had uh, policies in uh, Argentina, in Venezuela, a little bit in Brazil too, that do not lead to sustainable uh, growth. And uh, in a downturn, that's, uh, that's revealing. Now, there were also good policies and uh, accumulation of reserves, accumulation of uh, 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 basically assets in the sense that uh, debts are slower, smaller. So I don't think uh, uh, things are, 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 uh, uh, are extremely challenging. They're just uh, challenging. Um, some countries, we expect them to recover. This is the case of Mexico. Mexico has been uh, uh, doing its homework with reforms. And we, with the recovery of the US, uh, we do believe that we're going to get uh, a recovery in Mexico too. Um, in the case of Brazil, uh, we have signs of hope. Uh, we got a new finance minister, a new economic team. And that's uh, a sign of change that uh, if everything uh, works correctly and uh, he has uh, political support, we're probably going to get some rec growth recovery starting uh, next, uh, next year. Thank you, Elaine. Let's see if we have any questions. OK, well, if I may, I'll uh, ask one that we sure. received over social media this morning. And it, and it covers a, a, a topic and an issue which is, um, has become very popular here in Davos Clusters uh, over the past few years at least, which is inclusiveness and inequality. We obviously had a, uh, a, a report uh, published by Oxfam uh, earlier this week on the issue and also the forum um, itself. We published a discussion paper which is available on our website on uh, looking at the levers available to policymakers um, for driving economic growth as well as social inclusion, bringing a, delivering a social dividend with growth. But it's tricky. Uh, Latin America is a, is a region which actually has had relative success in driving inclusiveness. Um, and yet, as you mentioned, the outlook is, is, uh, is, is less optimistic than it has been in the past. 
Ilan, what are your views on the prospects for inclusiveness? And do you think it is possible to achieve the, uh, the holy grail of growth and social inclusion at the same time? It's, it's amazing how Latin America was able to grow and to include millions and millions of people uh, in the new middle class out of poverty. And that happened uh, from in the first uh, in 2000 to 2000 and I'll say up to 2012. We're talking about uh, 10 to 12 years. And that happened in um, uh, almost all the countries in the region, including here Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Peru, Chile, Colombia, almost all of them. Uh, of course, uh, it was facilitated by the commodity boom. And the commodity boom br basically brings home an income gain that if you are a minimum minimally successful in distributing this income. Uh, in some countries, it was done through social programs. In others, the distribution occurred through the labor market. Wages went up, you got more people employed, and that basically uh, uh, was the main driver of uh, poverty reduction and social inclusion. Now, uh, the state now is still not uh, the great. The level is still, even though we had improvements, you can still consider Latin America one of the regions with uh, uh, the worst income distribution. Not the worst in the globally, but uh, I will say one of the worst. Um, and poverty has improved, but uh, still you have some, uh, which means that there's a lot, a lot to do. And the question now is how are you going to continue delivering social gains when there's no growth? So the question, differently from the report, is not only if you have growth and social inclusion at the same time, but can you have social inclusion in periods where there's no growth? And this is the, the question now. Of course, Policymakers are working and to establish growth through several measures, several policies, some of them cyclical, some of them more structural. Probably we hope they will be successful, uh, but I'm not sure it's going to happen, for example, in 2015. It may take a while. And here is where uh, we, we need to see if we at least can keep the gains of the past. Yes, yeah, sure. So, can you give uh, your name for the benefit yeah, of our audience? Fernando Nakagawa from the Brazilian Newswire Agency Estado. Uh, do you agree with the forecast for the Brazilian economy this year with a flat uh, GDP for this year? And regarding the, si the fiscal situation, do you agree with the option? To level the 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 to to high the level of in taxes in Brazil is necessary to to get more of the taxes in Brazil. Uh, the first question: If I agree with uh, flat growth forecast in Brazil, uh, I I don't know who's the, this forecast of, of flat zero, but uh, I I I would say that uh, our forecast of zero point two is is not very far from zero growth, it's, uh, it's positive, it's better, but not much, uh, much better. And I agree because uh, it's a challenging year, it's a year of adjustments, it's a year of uh, uh, fiscal consolidation, it's a year where prices uh, are being adjusted, relative prices, and here I'm talking about regulated prices, which means that the consumer needs, will need to pay more so uh, it's not it's not going to be an easy year, and uh, our forecast of zero point two percent shows that. Oh, about the the, the measures uh, in Brazil, we just uh, heard about the new measures to uh, reestablish the fiscal numbers. There was uh, probably a deficit uh, last year. 
in the primary uh, number. Uh, and probably gonna, we are now heading toward a, a target which is positive of 1.2% of GDP. This is the new target of the new economic team. And uh, part of the measures were in the side of the spending, but part of the measures are in this, uh, on the revenue side, which is the nature of the questions. If I agree with the, with the measures on tax, I think there's no, uh, unfortunately there's no other option. The alternative of not doing anything or not raising taxes probably will mean uh, a deficit, and a new deficit will, will probably mean a deterioration of the conditions in Brazil, both fiscal and then uh, rating agencies, and, uh, and that will probably lead to a performance which is quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite bad. So, uh, given the alternatives, I do agree. Uh, it's never a good. Uh, nobody likes to pay taxes. Nobody likes to see taxes increase. Taxes are not good for growth, uh, but. They are the best alternative now to reestablish confidence, reestablish investment, and then generate growth. Any other questions? Let's just cast, uh, whilst we have you here, and let's just cast it a bit wider. We've talked about Latin America, of course. You mentioned Mexico is a, a, a promising bright spot. Are there any any other economies or sectors that you um, that, that you see? Doing better in 2015. I'm, I'm thinking perhaps there's a, some sectors could actually benefit from the restraint shaping of the economy um, post slowdown in China and the rebalancing in China. Well, uh, it looks to me that uh, the uh, the manufacturing sector that suffered quite a bit in the last 15 years because uh, the commodity boom led to the so-called Dutch disease, which is basically the depreciation of the currency, which made industry, manufacturing, traditional industry, much less competitive. The current status where we probably uh, were seeing some deceleration commodities going to the other side, we are now seeing exchange rates moving in the, w going to the weaker side, and that makes some traditional industries more profitable. And uh, you're probably going to see industry in Brazil, in Mexico, and other starting to regain access to uh, traditional markets, Europe, the US. Uh, as you probably know, China has replaced the, the US and Europe as the main trade partner of Latin America. And that probably will revert a little bit. Uh, going uh, going forward. On countries, we were quite optimistic about uh, Colombia. Colombia was uh, one of the stars of the region. Uh, policies very well uh, established. Growth continued to be strong. Even though we had China acceleration, we still had grow strong growth. Uh, unfortunately, Colombia uh, exports quite a bit of uh, oil and energy, and since the oil fell quite a bit last year, I now am not so optimistic about uh, Colombia anymore. I think for next year, we're probably gonna see some deceleration, and they will have to face a more, di a more difficult period with oil prices at around where they are. Okay, uh, let's take both questions and uh, see if we can cover both of them in two in the next five, few minutes. Sir, just give your name and then pass the microphone and we'll do both together. Well, my name is Alvaro Villalobos, I work for AFP. Uh, I'd like to, to know what, what is your outlook for Chile, uh, okay. taking into account that um, one of its major claims for copper, which is China, is now growing much less. Okay, so Chile outlook and yeah, madam. Uh, I'm Marta Beck, I work for Globo in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to uh, ask you about uh, the impact that you think that the fall in oil prices is going to have in the Brazilian economy. Okay, so Brazil, chi Chile first. Your choice, Elan. Yeah, let's start with Chile, the order it was asked. Um, so what, uh, on Chile, uh, Chile has the rest of the region is suffering so from commodity decline. In the case of Chile, we're talking about copper. Uh, uh, which uh, is one of the reasons, not all the reasons, but one of the reasons why 
Chile has decelerated quite a bit uh, this year. Uh, we are expecting only a moderate uh, recovery next year. And the reason is, is the investment, per investment uh, in, uh, the, in, 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 in the mineral sector in copper will probably be lower. And with lower investment, you're probably not going to get a strong recovery. On the domestic side, there's quite a bit of debate in Chile about the reforms, the changes of the new government. <coughs> uh, sometimes the reforms are such that uh, you introduce uh, some uh, debate that uh, made the country with some uncertainty in the transition, and that slows down the economy. Even though later you may actually benefit from the reforms, we don't know yet because they are not really complete. The tax reform is there, but some of the others we still don't, don't know. And that brings uncertainty. So from the copper side, including domestic issues, we are seeing the Chilean economy recovering, but only very, very slight. On the, on, on the question on Brazil, uh, the question, can you? The impact of oil. Oh, the impact of oil in Brazil. Here we have to separate between the short term and the, and the medium and long term. In the short term, when oil goes down, everybody likes, the consumer likes. You pay li less for your gasoline, you can drive your car, you can do things with more, you have more money. So that's in the short term, it ben benefits consumers all around the world, including in Brazil. So that's a positive in the short run. You, people tend to be happy and growth to recover, and that's the, the case also in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil also, we have another impact in the short run that make uh, life easier, which is prices go, uh, go, go down, which means that uh, uh, the main oil company, Petrobras, will actually get some cash flow because they import some of the oil they get, they import from abroad and they're gonna import this at lower prices and sell it domestically at a higher price which making some cash. So in the short run, I would say consumers are happy because gasoline prices are lower. In the case of Brazil, you do get some cash for the main oil company. Now, when you look at the medium term, it's a different story. <laughs> because in the medium term, Brazil is a supplier of oil there has been quite a bit of discoveries in the deep sea, the so-called the pre-salt. The lower the price of the oil, the less value you have on these discoveries and the oil. Which means that whatever is good in the short run, given the discoveries and what you were supposed to become a, a strong export, uh, it probably will mean less value now. So good in the short run, not so good in for Brazil in the medium run because of the result. <clears throat> okay. We have a few minutes left. I may just chance my arm with a question of my own. Sure. Sir, if you don't mind. Our global competitiveness report, which comes out every year around September, ranked three problems um, foremost with Brazil this year. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question on Brazil. Yeah. Infrastructure, <clears throat> institutions, and macroeconomic policy. And yet the bright spark for, for our economists, our own team, was the clusters of high-tech innovation, which they saw as a real promise for the, for the Brazilian economy. Can you give us a, um, you know, your thoughts on, on innovation? Because innovation is obviously so important, and it's obviously a theme of the meeting as well. Do you, do you see Brazil as uh, uh, having an ability to grow its innovation and its, its, its high-technology sector? Yes, I can see that. Uh, I'm not, I don't believe right now uh, Brazil is in the, in the leading edge in terms of innovation and technology. There's always uh, bright spots, and you can see the potential, but not yet. When you measure innovation by the number of, uh, of uh, uh, when you uh, registrations of uh, innovations, that is still are below international numbers. Um, but I see potential. I see potential from both the scale of the country to have quite a bit of, uh, of uh, it's, a, it's a large country, you have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, new people coming in, quite a bit of uh, money for R&D, 
So you do, you can get there. Uh, but you do need to evolve uh, in one of the inputs for innovation, which is education. Without education, without the brains, you'll still have innovation from the elite, but you do need a large, in large scale, uh, innovators, uh, people with high skills, and this has yet to be achieved in Brazil. Okay, thank you. And, and, and very, very lastly, I promise, yeah. your advice and your request for the region's central bankers in 2015. Well, uh, they are a very different bunch. There are central bankers that need to be careful about inflation. There are other central bankers that should be careful about uh, growth, growth slowdown. And yet others have to be more careful about the US interest rates increase uh, over the next few months. Uh, the ones that have to be clo watching closely the US is Mexico. Uh, the one that has to be looking more carefully about inflation is Brazil, where we're probably going to have an inflation above the upper limit of the target. And the rest of the countries, uh, Chile, Peru, even Colombia, should take care about low growth deceleration and, and lower interest rates. Elan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, it was, it was a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us and thank you also to our audience watching us live online. There will be further issue briefings and press conferences tomorrow. This is our last one for today, so uh, I will close now and bid you all a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>